Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we're continuing with more Ultimate Spider-Man. And I can't stress enough how this series, and really this whole 6160 universe has just been hitting all the marks for me. So if you're enjoying these videos, make sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so coming back, at this point, we continue in March, since each of these issues are jumping forward one month to eventually get us to that six months later future destination that Iron Lad Tony Stark had to escape to. So coming back in March, we find ourselves in the Parker household, with MJ and Richard kind of giving Peter and May the side eye, because MJ thinks they're hiding something. And it's a really cool and wholesome moment, because Richard's like, yeah, you know, I read this in a book one time. You see how they're avoiding eye contact? Very sketchy. So MJ asks Peter and May what's going on. So May just tells them nothing. And Peter's like, if by nothing, May means the simple enjoyment of some solid daddy-daughter time, then yes, absolutely nothing. Maybe the two of you are up to something and you're just deflecting. It's a real thing. I read about that in a book once. <laughs> and really it's just this wholesome family moment that we get here that I just absolutely adore 100%. Because you and I know, we know Peter and May's secret. We know what's going on. But right now, MJ's taking Richard to get some new shoes, though he's the type of kid who's like, you know, I don't think I need shoes, but mom says I do, so we're going. So on the way out, she lets Peter and May know that they'll be back in an hour. So as soon as they leave, Peter looks at May, and he's like, you wanna? And she's like, yeah. So next, they head up to the roof, and for a moment here, Peter goes through a number of different suit options, while May gives him the feedback. Which, in my mind, I like to think for the past month, you know, since the last issue, that Peter and May have probably gone through a lot more suit versions than the ones we're shown here. But as they go through these, Peter does one with a spider on his chest and they all black, and May just like, hmm, maybe some color, and seriously, less scary, dad. So next, he goes for one that kind of looks like Ben Riley's suit, and May's like, yeah, she likes the red, but aside from that, she's like, nah, it's not cool, dad. Then for the third one, which I would say kind of looks like a Spider-Man 2099 with a splash of Civil War Iron Spider, to where then for this one, May's like, hmm, maybe bring back the blue. So for the fourth, he goes blue and black, which I know I've seen somewhere before. Can't put my finger on it right in this moment. You guys let me know what this one reminds you of in the comments, because it might have been in the Insomniac games, but I'm almost certain I've seen it in Marvel's Avengers. I think you get it for free when you buy a pack of five gum. But either way, after getting help from May, Peter puts it all together. The red and the blue, the spider and the webs, and when they're done, this is how it turns out to be your more traditional Steve Ditko designed Spider-Man suit. And I gotta admit, with the way that this all played out, to me this has to be my favorite story behind the design implementation for a story about Peter Parker designing his first suit. Because let's be honest, at first when Peter got the suit, he was like bump it, I'm just gonna go all black which to me just sound like Peter being on his grown man type stuff. But to turn around and have this look, this decision, to scare his daughter, who later finds out that he is this guy, swinging around in black, so she then helps him to make it look less menacing, I really just find that story more impactful, or even more logical, than a lot of other explanations we've gotten before about why Spider-Man's first suit looked the way that it did. Because back in the day, there wasn't much of a story, it was just whatever looked nice, or what would a wrestler wear. So after this, next we head over to Ben and Jonah's new office, which I imagine has seen better days. I hope. But nonetheless, this is like their humble beginning. And I mean, sure, it's a bit of a fixer-upper, but hey, you gotta start somewhere. But eventually while they're here, Peter stops by with a plant that MJ told him to give as a gift, you know, to brighten the place up. But you can tell by the looks of the place that it's gonna need a lot more. And Peter even lets them know, like, hey, if you guys want people to work here, you're gonna have to fix this place up. But in the middle of this talk, Peter spots what seems to be a cork board with a huge map and a ton of pictures tying a number of people, places, and events together. So Peter goes to take a closer look and he's like, what is it? So Ben and Jonah just give him the generic answer. Like, oh yeah, it's a map. And Jonah even goes on to tell Peter, like, I'm not even sure we can say more than that right now, considering your current affiliations and place of employment. You know, with Peter still working for the Bugle. And it's funny because he just plays along with the two of them for a minute. But eventually Jameson ends up asking Peter if he's heard any chatter at the Bugle about a guy in a green suit waging war against Wilson Fisk. So Peter tells him, yeah, the guy's blowing up a bunch of stuff and Robbie's already calling this guy the Green Goblin. And he thinks there's a story there but the higher ups, they just keep shutting them down. 
because instead they're pushing stories about the guy in the black suit. And Peter, right here, he's just like, you know, I get it. He's extremely photogenic and to me, seems like a much more compelling and dare I say charming character, a real man of the people. So with hearing this, Ben and Jonah just kind of stare at Peter for a moment and Peter's just like, hey, just an opinion. And then Uncle Ben's like, right, well, anyway, as he goes on to let Peter know that all of these pens on the map are locations where this goblin fella is hit. And as it turns out, they're all owned by Wilson Fisk, which now just begs the question of what's the connection between this goblin guy and Wilson Fisk? Is this a classic bad guy, good guy thing? Or a good guy, bad guy? Or more realistically, a bad guy, bad guy thing? So Ben tells them that it's best that they don't jump into conclusions and instead just find out more about what's going on. And after this, we jump forward to Peter on a stakeout. And mind you, he's totally new to this. So all he really knows about stakeouts is what he sees on TV, where the good guys sit around and eventually the bad guys show up. But in actual practice, Peter's bored out of his mind. God. And after a while, he's like, man, all I do is sit here and eat. I hate this. That's it. I quit. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Ben's an idiot. Jonah's definitely an idiot. And he's like, I'm going home. And then boom, suddenly we got action. Cause right here, Peter comes across the Green Goblin chasing down Bullseye. And as we take a closer look, we're shown that there's a huge mismatch as far as experience here. Cause for a moment, Bullseye tells the Goblin that he knows he's never hunted before since he doesn't recognize a trap when it's right in front of him to where then he throws one of his metal cards right into the Goblin's bomb while he's holding it. But also when the Goblin asks Bullseye, who is he working for? Bullseye gives him this very cryptic answer which at first has the goblin thinking that Bullseye's working for Wilson Fisk, which I mean makes sense for anyone who's looking at this on a surface level, but Bullseye just tells him straight up that he doesn't work for Fisk, cause Fisk is a prop, a puppet, like you, like everyone else. And he goes on to tell the goblin, no, I work for the real masters of the world, the real power. I'm paid by the invisible hand to strike down those who forget their station, and I'm very good at it which just clearly means that he's working for the Maker's Council. But in the middle of this, Peter shows up. And as he goes to web up Bullseye, it's nice to see that this Peter is still cracking jokes, which I guess now has us heading towards more dad jokes. But a lot of Spider-Man jokes sound like dad jokes anyway. So I guess that wouldn't be too much of a difference. But for a moment here, Bullseye's like, great, another one. I just take two of these guys down and head home after this. So he throws more of these metal cards in Peter's direction. And Peter's like, hey, you're gonna have to have a little better aim than that. But as it turns out, Bullseye wasn't aiming for him. As his cards hit their actual target, the crane behind Peter, setting off his spider sense and seemingly burying him alive underneath all of this wreckage. Which now gives the goblin an opportunity to catch Bullseye slipping. But once again, Bullseye just comes out on top, cause next he hits the goblin with three books and a possible, which again puts the goblin in what seems to be a compromising position. But then it's here where the goblin turns the tables on Bullseye, cause he tells him, it's a real shame, a predator like you, not recognizing a trap, even though you walked right into it, which is a nice touch, because as soon as Bullseye looks over his shoulder, he gets caught with a grit hit, which just has me thinking like, well, clearly Peter's pulling punches now, but after seeing this hit, as well as the way that Bullseye just slides into the ground, and it just has me thinking like, man, Peter might need to shave off another 10, 20% from those punches. Cause I mean, it seems like this Bullseye is wearing a helmet, but still. Which by the way has me thinking, this design for Bullseye is fire. Especially the helmet mask thing he's got going on. But now after taking Bullseye down, the Green Goblin's just like, hey man, are you okay? And he even goes on to say, thanks for the help. And I mean, he didn't think that he would need it, but he's like, you know, I appreciate it. And it's pretty cool to see that these two just don't go straight into a fight after what just happened here. But now that things have calmed down, Peter, you know, he's still new to this. So he's just like, uh, hey man, so what do we do next? You know, I, I never caught anybody before. And it's funny how we see the smaller text. So it's like, he's saying that in a lower tone, but the goblin tells him he doesn't know who this guy is. And there's really no point in sending him off to the police because Fisk owns most of them. And this guy's somehow more connected than Fisk. So then the goblin just ties this guy to a drone and he doesn't really say exactly where he's sending them. <laughs> like for all we know, he just flew this guy into the sun. He could have piloted this thing to the bottom of the ocean, who knows? But as Bullseye departs to his uncertain fate, the Green Goblin looks over and he's like, that's an interesting suit you have there. I bet some people think it's very cool, which right here starts raising suspicion for Peter. And then the Goblin tells him, others might call it something else. 
proprietary to where next he pairs himself to Peter's suit and he reveals Peter's identity, which right here, this blew my mind because a couple months back when we talked about issue one, I pointed out that the goblin suit had a label on it that looked like an Osborne Stark Mark IV written on the shoulder that at the time had me thinking at one point either Obadiah or Howard had some sort of arrangement with Norman Osborne to where eventually we might see Tony pull something like this. So to see it play out this way instead, it caught me off guard, which I'm sure is the same way that Peter feels right here, right now. But right after the goblin does this, he removes his mask, revealing himself to be Harry Osborne. And the two of them just kind of have this moment where the goblin's like, hi, I'm Harry. And Peter's just like, mm, I'm Peter. Cause remember, we found out in issue one that these guys don't know each other. MJ told Peter she met Harry once. And I mean, Ben interviewed Norman a few times over the years, but Ben never got to know Harry for himself either. So right here, this is the two of these guys meeting for the first time and getting their first impressions. And with a very serious face, Harry tells him, well, Peter, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the world is a strange and dangerous place these days. So Peter's like, yeah, I'm starting to notice that. Then for a second, they just kind of look at each other. And right here, Harry's just like, man, you want to get a drink? Maybe talk about it. And right there, I'm just like, hey, let's go. But also this has me thinking about a few things, because for one, much like I mentioned before, how this issues put a new meaning behind the design of Peter's suit. To me, it also seems like now, with Peter and Harry finally meeting on a positive note, when the time comes with these two throw down, which I mean, you know it's coming. But when that time comes, it's gonna hold so much more weight because of the story behind the action. Which for me, it's that attention to detail that's got me invested in this story, big time. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below and we'll do it again on the next one. All right. Later.